Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will highlight the work of museum directors of Latin and Hispanic background and the importance of diversity in museum leadership with special guests, Amanda de la Gaza, director of Mexico City Museo Contemporario de Arte uh, Contemporáneo. Alejandra Peña Gutierrez, director of Puerto Rico's Museo de Arte de Ponce, and Silvia Olosco, executive director of Austin, Texas, Mexicarte Museum. So I'd like to thank you all for joining. It's just wonderful to have you. And, and I really appreciate your, your uh, toleration of my very poor uh, Spanish pronunciation. Um, I just want to kick this off by by saying what, what is generally called by the field of American art frequently traces back to just a small subset of traditions connected to Europeans and their descendants, but that definition is just so limiting and it's only a small part of the art of America. So it begs the question, how do we define America and American art? So let's talk about the incredibly rich and diverse arts tradition delivered by America and Americans. And Armanda, can we talk starting off with you about your view of what is comprised by the art of that is produced by Americans. And and you're on you're on mute. Yes. Hi, hi to, to everyone. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so glad to be with you and with of course with my colleagues Silvia and Alejandra in this conversation. And uh, I would like to say, first of all, that the term American art is termed mainly used in the US. Uh, and, and that's like to start with, like, of course, at MOAC, we have an international program. Many, we have many artists from different regions of, for example, Latin America, and also artists that work in the US or are based in the US or that even are American artists, so to speak. And um, in that sense, I think we need to, of course, broaden the conversation. For example, uh, last year we had a, like a seminar, international conference dedicated to indigenous contemporary art. And we use the term um, as the Americas, yeah? Like stating that it's like a, a very broad um, space of uh, territory, land, and that it's a very complex conversation in the different regions that do have a territorial sort of link, so to speak, and also different conversations that we, we are having and that we need more and more to, to become um, open to hear this conversation. For example, in, in the case of indigenous uh, art in the Americas, uh, it, it's like totally different how, for example, indigenous communities are named. For example, in the US, it's Native American people or um, in First Nations in Canada and uh, indigenous communities or indigenous people in, in the rest of uh, Latin America. So I think sometimes we are talking about different things when we talk about like American art or different topics. But I do believe we need to have uh, a conversation about it and in order to, to expand our views on what we should be talking about when we talk the art of the Americas or from the Americas. And for example, uh, you know, there's like this association, very important association of museum uh, of uh, uh, directors and AA, AAM. And um, sometimes it is hardly portrayed the, for example, the Latino art scene, or on the other hand, the museums in the rest of the continent that actually operate into an international realm. So I think we, we need to push forward this conversation, just not to stay between, you know, uh, the people we work with or the museums or institutions that work with, um, with the region, but rather that we can have a conversation with many other museums in the sense that to understand what are like the, the, for example, the lack of representation of certain communities in different institution across, uh, across uh, all the, the continent. So one of the things that you're saying is that, is that America can be, def can be defined by geography, but geography 
based in, in culture, that can be different. Uh, it cannot respect uh, national boundaries as they are defined in modern times, but more traditional boundaries. It could be defined in terms of language. It could be defined in terms of different cultural threads that, that different people bring uh, among them. You have immigration to, the, to these different countries. Alejandra, how do you look at the idea of the art of Americas as, as you develop your exhibitions and you're trying to engage in a dialogue of what's going on in the world. How do you think of this art? Well, I, I would just like to add to what Amanda said that, and you talk about geography and thinking of that concept, I can tell you what American art is not considered to be, and that is Puerto Rican art. So, uh, you know, that's very interesting because you see sometimes uh, Puerto Rican exhibitions in museums in the U.S. and people actually think they're international exhibitions. There is there is such a disconnect uh, with this island and um, and the knowledge of of it and to to really acknowledge that we're a territory of the United States and that Puerto Ricans have an American passport. Uh, Puerto Rico might not be a state but um, that doesn't change anything. So, um, you know, we, we really, I think that Amanda is right outside of the US, we don't tend to catalog as much. And um, I, I talk this way because, you know, my, my background, I'm also Mexican. So, um, and I, most of my career before coming to Ponce, I worked in, in Mexico. So um, we don't think, um, so much in labels, you know, and uh, and what we try to do at the museum is is keep a balance. Uh, you know, the 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 Ponce Art Museum has mainly a European art collection, so we have to follow that line, that thread, also. But uh, we like to include, of course, Latin American uh, contemporary artists and, uh, of course, Puerto Rican artists. So we we just try to balance things out. You know, I think it's really interesting because if you take a look at an artist who, li who lives and works in Vermont and an artist who lives and works in Puerto Rico, right? Do you, do, are, are they equally American? The answer is absolutely yes, right? Are they considered as your, as your, as you, as your point uh, states, are they considered to be equally American art, art? Well, the field has in the past not uh, given both equal consideration, but uh, should. Um, and by the way, I was just uh, uh, correctly criticized for my terrible pronunciation in Spanish of your names and the institutions. I want to apologize again. I'm, I'm doing my best and I appreciate your indulgence. I wish I could speak Spanish. Sylvia, when, when we're talking about the intersection of cultures, nowhere in the United States is that more clear in than in the founding of the state of Texas and uh, the the uh, the tensions that existed in the border that that predate modern times? Could you talk about your museum and how you approach this whole issue of 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 Americanness and and the intersection of cultures and how you present um, your art in in a way that that uh, drives that dialogue forward? Um, well, I think my thinking and, uh, you know, because I'm one of the founders of the museum uh, uh, and the museum has a lot to do with uh, where, you know, my origins or where I come from. My parents are both from Mexico and I studied my master's in Mexico City at San Carlos UNAM. And so um, I also started an institute of, of uh, information and research when I was in Mexico City uh, for five years. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't, and, uh, you know, we try to, I guess, control the, the, the way that we speak about our art, not using the term American, uh, because I believe American, Americano, is the whole <laughs> continent, you know, of North America and South America, Central America. And that refers to all these different art forms and I believe that you know the um, the the concept of American art goes par the development of that idea goes parallel to the development of ideologies here in the United States and manifest destiny 
and that you know we the you know, the, the people who controlled the you, you know the, the country at that time were, were not only thinking of expanding westward but south and to control everything and so they just uh, took upon themselves you know they they took the name America and made it theirs and in that way they believed that they own or control the whole, you know, have the, the still the concept of the whole continent, and they define their art in that way. And in the same in the same thinking, the museums, the first museums were controlled by that same kind of thinking, and so that that kind of thinking permeates today. I mean, even in the museums associations, the only people who can be in those directors meetings, if you pay a certain amount of money or you have a certain amount of budget. And, you know, I've never been invited to a director's meeting of the American Association or American Alliance of Museums. So I think that those kind, that kind of thinking is still today. And it is, that is why we, you know, people, the Latinos and Black and Asians, we have to create our own museums. And we start from, we started from zero, from nothing and have built up over the past you know, 50 years our institutions to try to uh, regain and to try to find our, you know, establish our place uh, within this, this country. You know, it's in interesting that you, that, that you say that, you know, when, when you build up edifices, when you build up systems, right? Systems generally tend to perpetuate themselves. I, I think one of the things that we all need to question is whether the systems that we have built up based in past attitudes are really functional in today's museum world. We very often, um, as, as we go around recruiting leaders, are told about the pedigree that leaders should have. The problem is that pedigree is generally um, uh, a confirmation of the past and can be uh, used to exclude people who question uh, past assumptions. How do you all feel about the way the museum uh, world needs to evolve in order to engage new audiences, to stay relevant to younger generations. Amanda, uh, with, with you um, in Mexico City, how do you see that having to uh, evolve? Or do you feel like you're on a you're on the correct track and can and can um, and can move forward as you have been? Do you feel like at this moment of time there needs to be a a re a renewed discussion of the role of museums in, in our world culture. Yes, I, I think it has to be, it's been rediscussed, I think, right now. Like we've had uh, many of us as directors of museum, museums have participated in so many conversations about how like to redefine our role in society. And um, like we have the actual traditional classical functions of preserving uh, art or, or researching if we have a collection of doing exhibitions or you know presenting artists and everything but I think we we have all uh, reached to a level of conversation in the sense that uh, we we are not innocent institutions we need to actually be critical with ourselves in order to move forward, in order to have a more open conversation of how we, we can achieve certain goals in terms, for example, of representing other communities and having a critical point of view and on our history as institutions, as cultural institutions, and how in some way the museum as like a general abstract idea has contributed to certain like for example colonial views of or have in the past marginalized um, uh, certain communities but in that sense i would say this is a product not just by um, the well uh, good intentions of institutions but rather also of like social movements um, and we can see that in all the um, uh, Black Lives Matter movement that have, has a very profound impact, uh, certainly in, in the US. I mean, what I've read in the news and everything, how this have, has actually moved the conversation, not just in terms of representation, like what type of, acts of artists do museums collect or do museums um, 
uh, like portray, but rather like even in the curatorial teams, in the teams and, and the, uh, the inside of the organization. And in that sense, in, in Mexico and in Latin America, the conversation, for example, about race is totally different. It cannot be uh, translated uh, literally into the, what is happening in the US. In Mexico, it has to be a lot with the, how, for example, indigenous communities have been left out of the main narrative of art uh, and how even to understand what does, for example, contemporary uh, indigenous art means in the sense that the notion of even contemporary art might be something that it's not related to the artistic practices of indigenous communities. So we have a very, very different conversation in that sense. But of course, we have been like um, uh, pushed to um, to go further into our boundaries. For example, uh, Muag is located in the south of the city, but how do we uh, do we become a more inclusive, inclusive museum? In that sense, for us, it has to do with access that we are so far away from the peripheric areas of, or that are the marginalized areas of the city. And people, for people to go to the museum, it's like a two hour or three hour sometimes um, uh, ride in, uh, on public transport or they have to pay and everything. So it's not, we are not actually providing in that sense, an easy access for people that uh, have uh, difficult you know, like social economical situation. So we are developing now for um, that's a program that it's how the museum actually uh, goes there, the goes to the to different communities, goes out from its comfort zone, which is the south of the city, and it's um, more rooted community, which is the artistic community, the people that already goes to museums and how do we do a um, larger, broader outreach, uh, trying to go to other places to develop programs and to develop relationship with other communities, uh, saying that our role is also not to show art in that sense, but to allow artistic experience for other publics, aesthetic experience to publics that normally don't have access to it because we believe that it is a way of um, having um, this notion of uh, like transforming um, the mind and uh, the mind of people having access to, to this aspect of life, which, is, which we believe, I believe is central to existence. You know, you're raising a very important point, right? Museums can frequently confirm the powerful in their power, right? Through access, through what is presented. Um, Alejandra, when, when you look at shaping the, the museum, and, and it is true, right? It's the people who have money who fund the museum, right? It's the people who have money who give, and that's where power aligns, the power aligns to, to, to wealth, who, who give the artworks. Um, who build the buildings, right? Who, if they're if they're in government, who are funding the 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 uh, the government funding streams? Should museums be questioning this? Uh, whatever structures there exist, is part of the the role of a museum is to provide voice to those who do not have power. I think it, it, they certainly have to, you know, and it starts uh, with the boards too. In the case, you know, I know Amanda's museum is a, is a different sort of configuration of a museum from my museum uh, because it's linked to the university and that's, you know, the, the institution that, that holds everything and it has its own rules. But in, in my case, in, in a private institution, even if it's an, a nonprofit institution, um, and this is the case for a lot of museums, we have to start by changing the boards. Uh, so we do approach people because they can donate. So we maybe have to also transform the, the giving policies. Some people might not be able to give money, but they can give knowledge. They can give a sense of the community. And, uh, and I also think very often that uh, we have to reach out to these people 
but also listen to them, you know, and that goes down in the chain and it comes back to what you were saying about the pedigree of certain museum directors. You're totally right. You know, you're never going to reach out to certain people if you don't start broadening your horizons and thinking, okay, you know, maybe I should take this person that didn't go to an Ivy League school, but uh, might have an interesting point of view on things. And, and it, Un, until we change that, I don't think there will be a significant change. You know, if the structure of power in a museum keeps being the same, it's going to be very difficult. And that, then it goes down also. It goes down to your staff and to listen to them, to get them involved in decisions, to see what ideas they have. Uh, and, you know, to really make it sort of a, a, a team effort. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting. Puerto Rico is sort of in the middle of things, you know, we're not tr fully Americans and and we have a lot of links, I find, towards Latin America. So um, this um, inclusion discussion is something we're also an island that we sort of see from from a distance. But um, I also think that, you know, at least in the case of, of the Ponce Art Museum, we have made a, a significant effort to bring in the community. Um, we did it after, you know, even before, but certainly after the hurricane where the museum was free of charge because none of us had any cash <laughs> and we weren't able to charge because, you know, there was no internet, there was no system anywhere. And uh, we've also, you know, there are grants available to be able to, to ask for money and bring people in or as Amanda is saying, we started with programs going to people, to public housing, to, you know, maybe not bring an exhibition to them, but bring uh, an artistic experience. We've, we've also done some work with, with a school up in the mountains of Puerto Rico, you know, so we've been, after the, the earthquake, we also reached out to, to, um, to the people. Um, they couldn't come to the museum. We had to close the museum right after the earthquake in 2020, but we did a lot of workshops in the shelters and, and we tried to, to reach out to them. But I do think that you need to change those um, power structures that, that are in place and rethink um, those in order to really be able to make a significant change. Now, Sylvia, we just completed two different polls. One was um, when a museum exhibits American art, you expect to encounter. What do you expect to encounter? 78% say said art produced by American artists who are white. Um, and then 48% uh, said American artists who are male. Um, and then the rest of the, the, uh, the answers were distributed pretty much in, uh, along uh, different uh, ethnic groups. Right. So you end up with this sort of confirmation of, in the past, power. Do you believe that, um, that museums need to take a different tact today? We just had a comment saying that the concept of museums giving voice to underrepresented viewpoints is rather modern. It's, it's very recent. Do you believe that museums have a role now? that is fundamentally different than, than might have been conceived in the past. How do you see it? Uh, yes, I do, because the because everything has changed. The community uh, is growing, we're, the community is more diverse, uh, the community is more informed. And so I think the, we have to break down those systems. And many times, you know, um, it has been said that the museums are the one of the last um, monuments that needs to be broken down uh, because it, you know, of its infrastructure, it, there's collections, its resources, they have to share those resources, they have to sometimes deaccession artworks that really don't belong to them, they belong to other communities. And so, um, and I think they have to be more representative of the communities. And also, I think make room for organizations like ours, like organizations of color, and share the resources. You know, our, our organization, our museum, we're going on our 38th year. We are a product of the community. Uh, we are the voice of the community and we exist because of the community uh, because there wasn't anything for the Latinos, for the Mexican Americans, <clears throat> for, for our community here. And so uh, it was through 
you know, talking to public officials because the, the only way we do not have the resources within our um, within our with individuals with with the private sector, there is no there are not resources within Austin, Texas, to support major museums from our own community. So we have to go to the public resources. Like that is specifically that is a trend throughout the United States of most. Uh, organizations of color uh, have have been born or exist because of major public funding. I mean, we were we just got a well three years ago a twenty million dollar bond uh, through the city of Austin to renovate our building. Uh, so we're going to be renovating our our we own the building, which also was through a service agreement. All of those things are through the pub through public support uh, because otherwise. Museums like mine, uh, this museum, not mine, but our communities would not exist without public resources. And so, um, yes, things have to change, but at this, and things have to change on the people who control the funding. The funding needs to be shared, it needs to be put out equitable, equitably so that we can catch up with the other major institutions. Because, you know, most museums are 100 years old. We're 38 years old, and there's museums that are two years old that are across the country. And so um, resources have to be shared federally in the federal level, state level, local level, foundation level, private level, so that we have we are equitable. Because it, at the end of the day, we have to serve our community. And we are in the in downtown Austin, we are in the center of the city, and it is on purpose. It is on purpose that we are here. We looked for a building that was in the center of downtown because this used to be where the Mexican American people lived. And we put murals on the side of a building and we do bilingual messages in English and Spanish so that, so that the people who speak Spanish know that there is something for them in downtown Austin. We go to the communities to teach the classes and you know where people don't have resources. We have a free day, just like in Mexico and most of Latin America, Sundays are free. Sundays are free and people are not intimidated to walk into museums. And so we continue that same tradition that I saw in, in Mexico when I lived there. When I walked into the Museo de Arte Moderno, I would see indígenas barefooted in the Museo de Arte Moderno. And that stayed within my, 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 my mind that I wanted everyone to to be able to, to feel that they were welcomed in, in our museum. See, that's, that's such an important point, right? The, the important point uh, is, is to not think that your preconception, Sylvia, or yours, Alejandra, or yours, Amanda, or mine, is the way to experience a museum, right? It's the way to enter the museum. Barefoot is fine, right? It's really the, the, the issue of how do you meet people where they are, which is what you're pointing out, right? How do you create different stories? You know, it strikes me that, that there is, while there is a lot of tension in society amongst different groups as we all struggle for power and voice within our various societies, there's also a lot of interest in hearing the voice of others, right, of, of really giving space um, and, and really trying to, trying to be informed. We took uh, another poll, which we say, we asked um, how, why do people mostly go to museums? And we found 52% said um, for stimulation um, in, in general, and then also to experience new artists. And then a, a, a last poll, we, we asked about how important is it that different genders, orientations, races, religions, perspectives, be equally represented in museums. And of course it's a select group, but 65% said absolutely critical. And 19% um, and said very important and 3% said, said uh, important and 13% said beneficial. So you've got this whole spectrum that really does weigh to, to diversity within museums. That's a really interesting idea. So, so let's go around the table and talk because we're coming to the end of our time. We'll give you the first word, Sylvia, then Alejandra, and you, Amanda. If you were going to make one major change to museums to position them as vital places of dialogue and attendance and excitement, 
in today's world, what would you change? Sylvia? I would make all museums free. All museums free? I would make them all free because at the end of the day, people do not come because uh, they because of the the you have to pay to come in. When we have free, it's just packed. And so I believe that that is the main obstacle is is for, is that it, in in the museums you have to pay. The Meaning that, that museums are not just for the tourists who visit. And the people who are there who can pay admissions, museum is there, is there for everyone. Exactly. Alejandra, if you if you were to make one change to to make now you can't choose Sylvia's. Uh, <laughs> That's a hard one because I was thinking the same thing as Sylvia. We have exactly the the same experience, but um, if not, you know, I think that we would have to do what we do, like to, to be more, be closer to our community and see what really interests them and how we can make them comfortable and meet them where they are, which is like uh, what you were saying, you know, I'm surprised when, when people say, uh, yeah, we hired certain people because certain people would come to the museum and wouldn't see people like them and I'm like where do you even live right so um it's um I think to me that's important to to make people feel comfortable that it's a space that they own that it's theirs um that I really think you know we owe ourselves to our communities and uh, I think one of the main reasons why we're changing some of us do it because of conviction but others because uh, there is a certain transparency right now expected from us. And we just can't get away with, with things anymore. And I like to say that really, if, if something has made the museum world change in the past year, it has been uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the pandemic. And if we were resisting to move into the 21st century, these two things have really pushed us to the other side and we have to come out on the other side of the tunnel completely transformed or we will be completely obsolete. That is such a great point. Amanda, uh, what, what is your thing that you would change about the museum world if you had your, your ability to do that? I would say, um... Can I say it's just one thing, right? <laughs> it can be. Well, two. you can say two things. <laughs> okay. One thing is that I, collections are really important, really important. Like how which communities are represented in the collections. So I would do like a like aggressive policy in terms of uh, collecting underrepresented communities because that's it's gonna stay for the future and that's gonna build up the new history of art what is in the collections not just in exhibitions and in and, and on one hand on the other hand uh, already Silvia and Alejandra have uh, spoke about this uh, is related to funding funding is essential for museums to operate so therefore I, I think even uh, private museums should have public funding. I mean, not all of it, but should be publicly funded. I think uh, in Mexico, there's uh, some private museums, but the public cultural system is very strong. Well, right now, more or less, but it's very strong. But I think this model of uh, being funded mainly privately uh, has a lot of consequences, not just in terms of the operation or the scale of museums, but in terms of uh, what is the demand of what is being presented in those, in those museums and their, how directors are constrained. So that is a model that do, do not allow to have like a more critical conversation um, because it put like deep strains on, on the on the development of museums uh, in terms of like having a more like uh, socially engaged or a more critical conversation. So I think, but the state uh, has a, should have a role 
definitely a more active role in the preservation of, of culture and in you know the notion of culture as development. So what you're saying is, is that as long as museums are funded by, uh, by wealth, then wealth talks. And when uh, museums are funded more demo democratically, then other voice, voices can emerge. It's not to say that, that one voice is wrong or right or anything else. It's just the multiple voices, if it's aligned to, uh, to who, has, uh, who already has power, then the voice gets skewed. And, and to create balance, you have to rebalance these institutions. I think it's a fantastic point. Uh, I am going to mangle your names one more time, uh, and I beg your forgiveness. I'd like to thank you all. Amanda de la Gaza, uh, Director of Mexico City Museo Universitario de Arte Contemporáneo. Alejandra Peña Gutierrez, Director of Puerto Rico's Museo de Arte Ponce. Uh, Art, Art de Ponce, sorry about that, Art de Ponce, and Silvia um, Orozco, Executive Director of Austin, Austin Texas Mexicate Museum. Thank you so much for your patience. It's my very poor Spanish pronunciation. Um, I, will, um, I will impose on you in six months, and let's, uh, we're going to invite you back to have another discussion to see whether some of these ideas, which are currently in discussion in the museum world, I gained some traction. I'd like to also thank uh, our attendees who have contributed a, an enormous number of questions, a spate of which came in right toward the end. I tried to get to as many of them as possible. Thank you all for attending. And I'd like to thank you, uh, wonderful leaders, for sharing your unique perspectives. This is this is an incredibly valuable discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm so very thankful that you were able to make the time for us. Thank you. Thank you for having us.